Medicine and the Machine podcast is brought to you by Medscape. Want the latest in medical news, expert perspectives, clinical tools, continuing medical education, and more? Stay on the pulse of medicine. Visit Medscape.com. Hello, this is Eric Topol, and I'm with Abraham Verghese, and we're really uh, thrilled to start our second podcast of Medicine and the Machine. We're going to today talk about the physical exam, how it uh, evolved over time, where it's going, how uh, AI may someday play a role. So, uh, Abraham, let me have you get started on your views of the uh, physical exam. I'd love to talk about the physical exam. Um, one of the things I think surprises students is to learn how recent our ability is to examine the body and life and you know, make the most basic observations. Um, I dated to Ornbrugger uh, in the late 1700s who began tapping on people's bodies much as he'd seen his father tap on the casks of wine in the bottom of the inn where his father worked. And, uh, you know, in a sense, Eric, that was the ultrasound of its day. That was the way to detect fluid in the lungs, consolidation, enlargement of, uh, you know, heart and liver and so on. And it was actually a profound moment in medicine because, and it was followed very quickly by the development of the stethoscope, the reflex hammer, the blood pressure cuff, and so on. And I think it represented, uh, especially the stethoscope, the carrying of the stethoscope represented a, a signal that we were no longer barber surgeons, but we were committed to trying to make a diagnosis on the body uh, and maybe even try to make a a, a characterization of what kind of illness this this is or was. So it's very recent compared to, you know, the history of medicine in general. And I think that, uh, you, you know, you and I trained in an era when I think the bulk of our data set came from that exam of the patient and a limited number of laboratory results that we carried in our head. But I think what was most memorable to me, one of the reasons I went into medicine was, seeing physicians who, you know, had this magical capacity, I thought, to come to the bedside and feel the pulse and feel the PMI and, you know, look at the neck veins and, you know, just sort of tell you, you're going to hear the murmur of mitral stenosis and you won't hear it unless you use the bell of the stethoscope lightly applied with the patient in the left lateral after some exercise. And it seemed like a kind of magic that they were divining things. Right, I agree. So I, I, some of my most memorable experiences in training were with Kanu Chatterjee and, stuff and the master of the bedside exam of the cardiovascular uh, system. And just as you say, I mean, he could he could predict to within a millimeter or two the the uh, pressures in every cavity of the heart, and I mean, just just extraordinary. But I, I want to just get to it from the patient perspective uh, because. You have, I think, so uh, elegantly described this ritual, uh, the expectations uh, from the patient. Yeah, I think it's become terribly important to try and understand that because clearly we have technology that surpasses the accuracy of, you know, the physician examining for most things. Not in neurology, not in a few things where, you know, you still need the exam to determine functional deficits. And so what is the argument and the meaning of all this? Why do we need this for the patient's point of view, from the physician's point of view? And I would say that it's a very important ritual. Um, you know, if you, if you look at rituals in general, rituals are all about crossing of a threshold. You know, we, we marry, we have baptisms, we have funerals, all with ceremony to indicate the crossing of a threshold. And if we step back and look at this ritual, Eric, um, it has all the trappings of ritual. You're coming into a room whose furniture doesn't look like the furniture in your house or mine. Uh, one person in this dyad is wearing a, a white ceremonial outfit with strange instruments in the pocket. And the other is in a paper gown that no one knows how to tie or untie. That's part of the mystery, you know. And then, um, you know, uh, incredibly, they divulge things that they would not in any other setting. And then at a moment in time, they disrobe and allow touch, which in any other context in our society is assault. So it already has all these trappings of ritual and 
I'm struck by the fact that patients uh, from many different cultures, ethnic groups, they may have very different beliefs about illness, but they quickly understand that you're about to enact a ritual. And they can be, I think, disappointed when they notice that you're not doing it well. That the, it, because to them, it's a kind of inattentiveness. And it's very similar to what we you know, judge in our baristas, our hairdressers, our short order cooks. You know, we, we, don't may, we don't necessarily know how to do what they do, but we know when someone's doing it smoothly and easily. And I think if you go beyond that, Eric, I think it serves an important function of localizing the disease on the body, uh, not on an image somewhere, not in a, uh, not in a, you know, numbers, not in histology slides, but on their person. And it's something about the exam that I think really validates their personhood. And you know, we live in an age when we're almost becoming disconnected from our bodies. You know, we can spend hours uh, on screens, on our phones, and almost unaware of our, of our bodies to the point where we hurt ourselves with neck injuries and carpal tunnel and, you know, you name it. Right. This becomes a very important moment, especially when they're ill, to reconnect to the body and to affirm the bodily nature of this illness, not some abstract thing happening out there. Well, the term laying of hands has a lot of meaning. Uh, of course, you're getting at that there's less laying of hands uh, and that is a, an expectation of patients. They want to be examined. They, they want the touch. Uh, and they know when they're not really having the real exam. I mean, like you've commented on you know, listening to the heart, but through a shirt or a blouse. Exactly. <laughs> I, mean, I, I remember after having the knee replacement and having such a tough time and the orthopedist not even looking, examining the knee or having me walk or whatever. So you know this, but the story that um, I, I told, which I still remember so vividly, was this patient of mine uh, from Cleveland who flew out to San Diego and he was having problems with uh, angina. And I had my colleague here uh, see him because he wanted to whisk him away to the cath lab. And he did examine him. I was in the room. But after the procedure, when he had a stent uh, that, that my colleague did, I went to see him in the hospital, and he was very mad at me. And this is somebody who I had a relationship with for you know, more than 10 years. And I said, well, what's the matter? And he says, well, you didn't examine me. <laughs> and I've never forgotten that. Yeah. That, that was an expectation. Uh, and um, the other thing that is troubling is that there's the pseudo-exam on the side of doctors that – they write WNL in the, in the record. Exactly. We never looked. Do you, <laughs> you want to comment about that problem? No, for, but first to echo what you just said, I think that um, there's a profound human need, especially in the context of illness, to get the sense of that you, that you have the attentive attention of that person. Um, you mentioned therapeutic touch, and you know there's a whole body of somewhat fuzzy literature on that, much of it from uh, the nursing community. And, I don't doubt the importance or validity of it, but when I talk about this, I think it's helpful to accept that there is perhaps such a thing, but to focus more on the ritual and what that accomplishes. And in my mind, I think that your, your desire to have yourself examined by the knee specialist, your patient's desire to have you examine them is almost like a fundamental human need in times of illness. And I think we're learning now that um, the placebo effect, when it works, is profound. Mm -hmm. It doesn't you know, mm -hmm. just trick the patient. It's producing a real neurohumoral uh, surge of uh, endorphins and things in, in the brain. And we're recognizing that you can have a placebo without a placebo, meaning touch, tone of voice, setting. All these things have a tremendous influence in also causing the same neurohumoral surge. So... I do think that um, you know this profound need of ours has a therapeutic implication. Mm. Uh, I have an anecdote of a distinguished colleague who just passed away. He's a cardiothoracic surgeon, very eminent, but he's also, also late in life got his PhD in English. And he had a shoulder problem. And uh, the state of the art now with shoulder is apparently ultrasound. So he saw the ultrasound tech and then saw the best surgeon uh, around for this problem. And 
that surgeon couldn't have been more attentive, more solicitous of the senior colleague. But later when he was telling me about it, and, and it turned out they couldn't do surgery, later when he was telling me about it, he said, but you know, Abe, I wanted him to touch me. Mm. <laughs> and I thought that, you know, hearing that from a cardiothoracic surgeon, it just threw into relief how basic this, this need is uh, to be touched. But Eric, I, I would also ask you, beyond the touch, don't you think that in this complex age, we're still in great danger of overlooking the simplest sort of things if we don't you know, make that contact with the patient, if we don't do a quick survey and make sure all the numbers and stuff are gelling with what we're seeing on the body, with what we're seeing in the patient's face. What do you, what do you have to think about that? I completely agree. I mean, that's, we're getting into a, a part of medicine that will never be digitized. It's not a machine learning experience. Uh, there's not going to be any algorithm that's going to touch the patient that's going to provide that check, that oversight, that human um, uh, experience. So, you know, I think bilaterally from both the patient and doctor side, it's, it's a way to confirm what's going on. I mean, as you say, so I think it's, it's a fundamental importance. One of the reasons I think that it may have eroded the willingness to do a more thorough exam, well, even if it's, you know, for, for like we talked for cardiologists, the heart and uh, lungs and, and pulses, or, you know, whatever uh, general exam is lack of time that, that, you know, doctors feel rushed mm -hmm. and they also rely too heavily on getting scans, mm -hmm. referring patients. They figure, well, what am I going to do with this exam when I could just send the patient for you know, a total body scan or, you know, something short of that, of course. Right. Uh, this, I think, you know, there's this, as you wrote about some years ago, the, uh, the eye patient, uh, basically uh, the default is to revert to the eye patient rather than the patient. Yeah. And I think Eric, you, you're right. I think part of it is our failure to communicate these skills and teach them to the next generation as well as we should and to make, make it relevant to them and make them feel that it's valid. So it's clear that uh, in any ritual, whether it's, you know, staying high mass or, you know, the ritual of hitting a ball, uh, you know, in baseball, you need a long apprenticeship to do it very well. Mm -hmm. And you need a lot of coaching. Right. And clearly we're, you know, we're giving lip service to this uh, aspect of the training. Our, our residents can talk your ear off about the sodium and, uh, you know what it means if it's low or high, but that same facility they don't necessarily have at the bedside, and it's not our, it's not their fault. It's our fault. You know, we just haven't imparted that to them, and I think they need to see us doing it in a way that is useful. We did a study some years back with my colleagues um, John Ioannidis and Jerry Casir, where we looked at, we asked physicians to tell us stories, anecdotes of oversights in the exam that led to consequences. And the study is still going, ongoing, but we published in the American Journal of Medicine when we had 200. And, you know, the basic problem was that um, most of the oversights were because the exam had simply not been done. And yet the, the recorded exam in the computer, every checkbox has been ticked and it suggests that it's been done, but the person submitting the anecdote knew that it hadn't. What kind of stuff, you know, are relevant to your specialty? People with chest pain coming in and in the cath lab, contrast being injected, and as they are turned some way or the other for a particular view, there is a rash that looks like dew drops on rose petals and it's shingles. I mean, so we collected 200 of the, those kinds of mm. oversights that had, you know, diagnostic delay, contrast exposure, surgical misadventure, and uh, I actually teased my friend uh, Tul Gawande that we need to write a, or we, uh, that I want to write a, another book called Checklist, but mine will be very simple. It might be three or four pages. You know? <laughs> and the first one will be patients have a front side and a back side. So <laughs> look at the back side. Juicy things happen between the back side and the bed sheet. I mean, I mean I'm being facetious, but uh, I know you agree with me that that, that, moment of seeing the patient it's not just a ritual but there are things that you might see that might not gel with the information you have otherwise especially i think in the icu and rather than act on the numbers it's always helpful to take a good look at the patient too 
I like that. I like that short uh, checklist that you're kind of, <laughs> that's, that's good. You can read the transcript from this podcast and find more medicine and the machine episodes at medscape.com backslash machine. Medscape news features clinical tools and education are available for free. Stay on the pulse of medicine. Visit medscape.com. Well, uh, Another part of this story um, is the modern physical exam. Uh, not that we want to lose any of the things we've been talking about, but to actually build on it. So, you know, I think one of the uh, memories I have for many, many years because of the influence of my mentors like uh, kind of Chatterjee and Arthur Moss was this thorough physical exam. I, I used to love to teach the bedside you know, the splitting of the second heart sound. Oh, yeah. yeah. All the other things you could hear and, and just to look uh, and to no less the, uh, the touch of the, of the chest. But, of course, now it's hard to, to belabor that and spend all that time trying to listen and convince the, on rounds that the, the, uh, the students and the residents fellows should hear things that you're hearing when you can see it. And I know that this is an area where we uh, converged some years ago that now with smartphone ultrasound um, that you can just bring out as part of the exam that you could actually see much more informative than you could hear. So, yeah. and of course, is some people are revolting about this and saying that, which of course is not so dissimilar to the stethoscope in the 1800s, which took 20 years to get accepted. Yeah. Uh, and now we're, we're in the early years of that perhaps 20 year revolt or yeah. rebellion. But the point here is that people think that it's going to lead to all sorts of incidental findings. Actually, it, in my view, it, it reduces the need to even think of sending a patient for uh, an echocardiogram or for other parts of the body. For example, you may think there's a uh, abdominal aneurysm and then you get out the ultrasound and say, Oh no, actually the aorta looks pretty good. So, uh, the question I have for you is, should an ultrasound uh, with or without uh, artificial intelligence uh, support, whether obtaining the images or interpreting the images, but let's say, put that aside, should that be considered part of the modern exam? Do you think it will evolve that way? You know, I think it already has, so it's an unequivocal yes on my part. Uh, but before I uh, say more about that, Eric, I want to pick up on something else that you said, which is, you know, there's this trope out there that the physical exam is useless um, mm. and that there are studies to back that up. And I think that that's referring mostly to the, you know, the, the, the so-called executive physical where you do this well person exam. I actually think it's helpful to do. There's a bonding that takes place and you stumble onto things. But I would agree that by and large, the routine physical isn't much use. However, People have conflated that with a patient coming to the ER or your clinic with a specific problem. I think the physical exam done with that problem in mind uh, has a very high yield. You know, someone coming to sh with shortness of breath to your clinic, you're looking for a whole different set of things than if you're just doing a routine physical on a well patient. So mm -hmm. I think making that distinction that the physical exam is extremely helpful, is very efficient, and it allows you to ask better questions of your test when you're dealing with a focused problem. And in some cases like neurology, there is no other way to get at the functional deficit and to correlate all these images with what the patient actually has. But yeah, coming back to the, the tools we carry, I'm all for it. I think the more things that we can carry that allow us to not have to send people to suites and wait for reports to come back you know, more things that we can do at the bedside and interpret for the patient, the better. And I actually think that the ultrasound is, is a wonderful tool. Um, provided we, you know, we, we are sort of all in agreement on what it is we can use it for reliably. Right. And I think we need to learn as well as we learn from masters like Kanu. So I think, you know, getting a sense of contractility, getting a sense of, you know, the fluid status, uh, how well the, you know, IVC collapses, uh, using it to confirm uh, neck veins, you know, it's at, the at the bedside, teaching students that that is in fact a, a neck vein and showing it to them by on your little screen, extraordinarily helpful. So 
Um, I would say anything that we can bring to the bedside that allows us to look in there is wonderful. The key element is that we should still be there. It would be a mistake to do those things and disappear ourselves. And You're bringing up a really uh, important point that I hadn't thought of until now, and that is I asked kind of Chatterjee as we became friends beyond him being a mentor, I said, how did you get to be so good at this? I mean, you're like one of the best in the world at being able to detect and uh, differentiate uh, parts of the heart exam. And he said, well, Eric, what I did was uh, with the Swan Gans catheter, every patient for all the time that he was at Cedar sinai he would examine the patient at the same time as getting the pressures in the heart. Wow. And that sharpened his exam. And so he did this correlative type of uh, you know, long-term training. It's almost like training an algorithm, you know, but he's training himself. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody had that experience because we didn't have hundreds and hundreds of uh, Swan Gans catheter insertions. So, and he deliberately went after that. Uh, but you're bringing up the point is that the use of this adjunctive tool to see things can actually sharpen your exam. That is, you know, going back and forth. Interesting. Yeah. You know, it should sharpen your exam. Having said that, you know, I've always thought that the great paradox is William Osler was a, by all, you know, by all accounts, a wonderful clinician, good at the bedside, probably no different than the, you know, the top people of that era. But he had to rely on autopsy. There was one year where he did something like 400 autopsies to get at what was really going on. And I've always thought this is peculiar because we can in life see all the things that Osler had to wait for an autopsy for, you know, the mm. vegetation on the valves, the size of the spleen, the liver, all that. And you would think it would make us so much better at the bedside because we'd have these Kanu Chatterjee kind of affirmations with our data. But I think exactly the opposite has, has happened. We've, we've disowned the body and we've taken ownership of the data. Uh, we don't trust uh, the body. And I think that pitting one against the other is just a false uh, dichotomy. We, we don't need to be doing that. They're both important. Right. So see the patient, examine them, find out what's tender, and look at the data, and then you know, bring them all together and make sense of it. Well, that's really well put. You know, I think this is another facet that I found recently to be illuminating. So, of course, we were taught to take the pulse. The pulse is kind of the window to the cardiovascular, and it's a way to start the touch. Yes. And I still want to take the pulse. However, uh, the modern pulse, which I only experienced in recent weeks, was this six-lead smartphone electrocardiogram. And they're exquisite tracings where you take the, have the patient take, you know, put their fingertips on the sensor. Uh, it looks like smaller than a credit card, and they put it on their left knee or their left leg anywhere and they get the six lead cardiogram which you look at together with the patient and again here you have some doctors who are saying oh this is crazy uh why would you do that and i'm saying well wait a minute this is just more informative and it's actually yeah. kind of fun yeah and it pre preempts again the need for uh, sending somebody for a cardiogram when you can see things now what i had this experience that kind of really shook me the other day when this when I started using it, because I saw this patient, he came for a second opinion, and he had been worked up twice for a heart attack with high troponins, and uh, he also had a cardiac cath, which showed normal coronaries, and he also had atrial fibrillation, and so he came to see me like, what's going on, and I started off with the uh, six-lead ECG after I did his pulse, and it showed very low volts, and he said, hmm. oh my I wonder if this could be, you know, amyloid of the heart. Then mm -hmm. I took out the probe and put it on the phone, and there it was, the speckled, you know, uh, heart yeah. plastic yeah. finding. I said, how yeah. could I have diagnosed this? How could you diagnose cardiac amyloid in <laughs> 2019 with a smartphone? I mean, why do we reject this type of uh, potential advance? Yeah. No, I think you're, you're absolutely right. And you know, I think it shouldn't be either or. Why not pulse and the EKG? Right. You know, um, I'm thinking about the, you know, the recent spate of airplane crashes, one of which was 
you know, very close to my heart. A plane crashed in Ethiopia, the land where I was born, and you know, affecting an airlines that I knew well. Uh, and then the other one was, you know, you know the the particular model I'm talking about of airplane where the software was telling the pilots something, and yet they were looking at the horizon and knowing that that was wrong. And I think we need those constant checks and balances. There will be occasions when an EKG, you know, is is the leads are put on wrong. And, you know, the patient does not have dextrocardia or whatever. Right, right. So, I've think, already experienced that, by the way, because <laughs> if you don't put that sensor, if you don't put it in the right upright position, you get uh, the leads, you get a funny <laughs> axis. It's all screwed up. You say, oh, my gosh. And so, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And I, I do like the idea that um, the, these are complementary, that they add the, to the informativeness uh, of the exam that they shouldn't be summarily dismissed as, as uh, yielding incidental findings, but rather enriching. Uh, I think that's the key. Of course, you know, uh, uh, people say, oh, well, you need to do prospective studies of the value, but was there ever a prospective study of the use of the stethoscope? That's right, yeah. Or I, cabbage I, or anything like that. Yeah, or any, or, you know, palpation. <laughs> Should there be a... a a study about these things. These are like basic tenets of what an exam would be, and yeah. it's going to continue to evolve, I would think. In fact, I think there's been a whole area of scholarship on taking individual aspects of the exam, just one sign, and then talking about specificity and, you know, sensitivity and operator characteristics. And, you know, there's there's something to that, but I, I, I think that we never, we never sort of do that in isolation. We're taking all these pieces of information together and you know coming up with something there was well, an yeah yeah go ahead i'm sorry there was an anecdote in the new England journal of medicine that struck me again these are not common but they're cautionary tales where you might have seen this about a patient who came in with a high uh with liver dysfunction but a high lactate that didn't gel with his appearance he looked pretty well he had moderate elevation of the enzymes but the lactate kept being quite high and uh, to make a long story short, the puzzle was only solved by the patient's sister who happened to be a phlebotomist and was visiting him and made the observation that the phlebotomist kept drawing from his veins right below where Ringer's lactate was hanging because she couldn't get it from some other site. And so, you know, it might have just been the proximity to the Ringer's lactate. Wow. What machine is ever going to tell you that? You know? Right, right. Well, that was the point I was getting at, which is, up until now, the physical exam is essentially analog. It's the, the doctor's, uh, clinician's observations, whether that's through palpation or visualization or, or auscultation. Now there's this digital component, which is the recording, uh, for example, of an ultrasound or an ECG as part of the exam, you know, uh, not to lengthen it, but to add this other dimension that it's now archived, that exactly. it can be given to the patient, uh, can be put in the chart, ideally. I mean, this is a different dimension. And there's a lot of discomfort with this. That is, that uh, it somehow it crosses a line when you go from analog to digital. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really understand it. Oh, that's strange. Yeah. I don't understand it either. I'm surprised. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, for example, you have a patient comes in and they have abdominal pain. And instead of you know, reflexly sending them for an abdominal ultrasound, you say, okay, I, I'm going to look at their gallbladder now, and you see whether they're stoned in mm -hmm. seconds. And yeah. so, you know, I, now part of the other story here is that uh, there's no reimbursement for this, mm -hmm. you know. So there's this revolt. Well, I don't want to do this because I don't get reimbursed, and or may I may even have to have additional training to do this. Yeah. I rely on sonographers to do this. Yeah. And now we're seeing these companies, uh, like in Europe, Ultramics and, and other companies that are trying to uh, basically use AI to provide the interpretation. Yeah. And the company Butterfly, which is telling you, you need to move the probe up to the left, you know, two centimeters and to the right yeah. to get, acquire better images. So I don't know if we're ever going to override these obstacles about the need for uh, accepting uh, some some added dimension to the physical exam without detracting from what ought to be part of it. 
Yeah, and I think that, you know, uh, if, if the ultrasonographer, namely someone like myself, isn't a trained ultrasonographer, uh, you know, I think that what, what the data does is pretty much the same thing that data does for me in the rest of the physical exam. So I might pick up that this patient has aortic stenosis and, you know, rather than sending them for an echo to say, what the hell is going on? I hear a murmur. I'm asking a better question of my cardiology colleagues that I know this person has aortic stenosis. I'm sensing that the valve gradient is borderline. Can you tell me what it is? So asking better questions of our tests. So I think similarly, if we were to do an ultrasound and pick up something uh, like a gallbladder, then the next step would be to send them for a more formal study to ask a better question, which is that we know this is a gallstone now. Tell us about the status of the bile ducts and, you know, things that are, I think, beyond uh, what our training and our little handheld machines can tell us. You know? right. Well, I totally agree. And one other point just to make on this is that people think that technology is depersonalizing, dehumanizing, and yes, that can happen. But the experience that I suspect you've had as well, when you have some captured this video loop, yeah. now you're showing it to the patient in real time, something they would never see if they go for the formal study because they're not allowed to have the sonographer review that with them. Right. So you have this you know, shared experience of uh, teaching and uh, yeah. going over the findings essentially in real time. And to me, that actually adds to the bond or the intimacy. Oh, it's profound. It's profound. I think, you know, we're, Eric, we're really talking here. I know we're talking about the physical exam and ritual, but we're also talking about connection. And there have been some profound studies now to show that why is it that, you know, patients uh, do better or more compliant, might even have better mortality or survival if they are taken care of by a physician who looks like them. You know, and uh, why is it that they are more willing to get their information in a barber shop than in a sterile clinic. Mm. And I think it's all about human connections, all about that sense of identification and connection. And uh, in my mind, there's nothing like a skilled exam to break some barriers and, you know, uh, instill a certain confidence. I'm not confident if someone doesn't touch me with finesse and, you know, just tells me, well, it looks like you need to have this done. You know, it's just hard to take that without a little bit of awareness, you know, I want to feel I'm connected to this person that what they, what they said is backed up by how they were with me, how it felt, you know? All right. All right. Well, you know, this interesting to, to look back and that is uh, when Rene Lenek started the stethoscope, yeah. the doctors revolted in part uh, because they said that this, this tool would disconnect them from the patient. <laughs> they, would, would, yeah. they would make that, the, and, and now, of course, as they evolve, that, that part of the exam is what people feel does indeed connect them. Yeah. So I, I think your points you're making there are, are great. Um, you know, I think this has been a fun discussion. I, I, I know this is something that will continue to evolve, the physical exam. Uh, the interesting thing is there are such rich aspects of it that hopefully will not devolve as they have, but in fact will be uh, supported, will be enriched as, as technology becomes part of the exam, which seems like it's inevitable in some respects. Uh, but, you know, in some ways it, it, it's exemplary for the, the medicine and the machine, that is, this tension that we have. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And as I, like, said, I like the way you summarize that. I think you're absolutely right. It's, uh, it's going to evolve. But it's important uh, that it evolves, you know, and uh, neither of us are, you know, uh, Luddites trying to keep things as they are. You especially are not a Luddite. <laughs> I've, been well, I've been accused of the opposite, of course, <laughs> but hopefully uh, our discussion is enlightening that, you know what, there's some reasons to be thinking about this stuff. And not I, think, I think the most surprising thing about my first meeting you is to recognize how much common ground we actually had. Um, which is how this has come about. So thank you, Eric, for that. Oh, no, I appreciate it. Uh, now we're going to keep going with our uh, podcast. This is just number two after the introductory session. In the future, we're going to also be inviting some guests that will add to the perspective. 
Uh, but this is the one on the physical exam. I think it's been a, a fun discussion. We couldn't cover everything, just like it's very hard to do a total body physical exam thoroughly. But at least we, we hit some of the key points. So thanks very much, Abraham. Thank you, Eric. Pleasure always.